Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Lara Di Tommaso. I'm a research and policy analyst here at the Mental Health Commission. Before we get started today, I'd like to briefly talk about a couple of housekeeping items, as well as give you an overview of the MHCC's policy work on expanding access to counseling psychotherapies and psychological services. Please remember that the audio for this webinar is provided in broadcast mode through your computer speakers. So you can hear us, but we cannot hear you. If you're having any trouble with the audio, check your settings on the computer or contact Adobe Connect at the number on the slide. Also note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the MHCC website in the coming weeks. If you have any questions or comments, please type and submit them through the Q&A chat box on the bottom right of the screen. Note that we will hold most of the questions until the end of the presentation. Please note that you can download the slide deck and the reports right now by selecting documents on the right and clicking on the download files button. Today we're going to be hearing from one of the authors of the report, Expanding Access to Psychotherapy, Mapping Lessons Learned from Australia and the United Kingdom to the Canadian Context. So this work has evolved over the course of the last two years. Um, we know we know that despite the prevalence of mental health problems and illnesses in Canada, people's needs for counseling, psychotherapy, and psychological services often go unmet or are only partially met. Programs to inc increase publicly funded access to psychotherapies have the potential to reduce barriers to these important services and support. In early 2017, the Mental Health Commission of Canada initiated a process to begin exploring policy options for expanding access to these vital services in Canada. The first step undertaken was to commission a background paper synthesizing relevant literature and stakeholder perspectives on key policy issues and questions. This paper informed a one-day roundtable held on March 21, 2017. Building on this first discussion paper and the roundtable, the MHCC commissioned the development of a second discussion paper to support ongoing dialogue and evidence-informed decision-making at the system and surface planning level. We have the opportunity today to hear from one of the paper's authors, Mary Bartram. Mary Bartram has extensive experience in mental health policy development with federal and territorial governments, indigenous organizations, and NGOs, including as the director of the mental health strategy with the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Mary completed her dissertation on access to psychotherapy at Carleton University in December and is currently working as an independent researcher and consultant. Mary, it's a great privilege to have you here today. Thank you for joining us, and I will turn it over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Lara. Um, I'm very excited to be here today to talk about this new report. This topic is one that's a long-standing, keen personal interest for me. Uh, I started my career as a family therapist and saw firsthand what it was like to uh, wait, be on a waiting list for over a year sometimes for publicly funded uh, psychotherapy services in, in Canada. Um, in, through my involvement with the mental health strategy, I gained a much uh, greater appreciation for some of the challenges and opportunities um, for mental health policy making in Canada in what I would term our radically decentralized um, uh, federal, provincial, territorial system. And also as a consumer, uh, navigating the mix of employment-based, publicly funded, and private psychotherapy services um, here. And then finally, as a researcher, this topic was the focus of my dissertation research. And basically what motivated that was, if it can be done in the United Kingdom and in, and in Australia, what would it take to make this happen here in Canada? So before I get started, I just want to point out that I'm not going to be reviewing the evidence base for the effectiveness of psychotherapy, the clinical effectiveness, or the uh, business case, the uh, economic benefits uh, that can arise from improving access to psychotherapy. If you're interested in, in learning more about that, I would recommend looking at uh, the 2017 report put out by the Mental Health Commission that was authored by my colleague, Howard Chodos. Okay, let's start. So first of all, why is this analysis important? Uh, as Lara uh, alluded to, uh, the exclusion of allied mental health professionals from public insurance in Canada has contributed to, uh, has had a variety of impacts. Um, 
the highest rates of unmet need for mental health services in Canada are for psychotherapy. Um, the, uh, you know, the people who have the least financial resources the, are the ones who face the greatest financial barriers in accessing care. And in addition, with the limited range of services that were included in um, uh, public health insurance in Canada, that has also contributed to what we see as this level of underfunding um, with only 5 to 7 percent of public funding on health care in Canada dedicated to mental health. And while Australia and the UK faced essentially similar challenges, they've been able to introduce um, major reforms. So right now, what's particularly exciting about this topic is that with the uh, $5 billion federal transfer, targeted transfer to improve access to mental health services, um, which started last year and will roll out over the next nine years, there's a new window for reform which has not existed before. And we've started to see um, Ontario and Quebec with some initial investments in expanding access specifically to psychotherapy. We've seen uh, British Columbia including um, uh, services for people with mild to moderate mental health disorders included in their 2017 guidelines for primary care networks and we've seen some commitments in Newfoundland and Labrador as well um, including for online access to online therapy. So uh, it's very timely to take a deep dive and look at some of the implementation issues. The purpose of this analysis is to support dialogue and evidence-informed decision-making here in Canada. I mean, this, this report is really targeted to policymakers. However, I think it's something that everyone can learn from and engage with and consider um, what the implications are for their efforts to keep this issue on the front burner. Um, and to do this by mapping what we can learn from the implementation of reforms in, in uh, Australia and the UK onto our context here. So basically, they've had 10 years of implementation experience in, in uh, the United Kingdom and in England specifically in Australia. The two models that have been implemented are, uh, you know, a textbook case of very different. So we, we've got two very different approaches to, to look at. Um, what are the lessons learned from these and, and how can we adapt them here so that we don't start from scratch, that we start as strongly as possible as we um, begin to introduce more reforms uh, in, in this area. So let's take a look at the key features of the Australian and the United uh, Kingdom models. In Australia, um, better access, which is what it's generally known as, was launched in uh, 2006, and it was really motivated uh, by the results of their national uh, health survey, population health survey, which showed that um, two out of every three Australians with mental disorders were not accessing treatment. The approach that they adopted was uh, to um, expand their Medicare. So they added uh, psychologists, social workers, and occupational therapists to their um, federally managed uh, health insurance program. Um, at the same time, there's some targeted complementary investments from the federal government uh, to higher needs communities um, and so forth, but uh, this was kind of their showcase response to uh, this survey results. Um, the workforce quality is assured by, uh, by um, professional associations. So they, they essentially said, we're looking for qualified providers, and the qualifications are, are those determined by the psychological association, the social work association, and so on. And their main source of um, performance monitoring was through uh, an evaluation that was done in uh, 2011. So it's basically as if the Canadian federal government ran health insurance, as if we had uh, a C-HIP here instead of a, an O-HIP. And um, psychologists, social workers, and OTs were added to um, the coverage with the main difference being that extra billing is allowed. So in Australia, 
um, providers are allowed to charge co-payments on a discretionary basis, which would not be allowed here under our health insurance, under the Canada Health Act. In the United Kingdom, the approach is kind of the polar opposite, although the objectives of expanding access are the same. Um, the real driver for it was um, the response to new guidelines from, the, uh, from NICE, from the National Institute for Clinical and Evaluative Excellence, I may have that wrong, um, and also a very strong business case that was made about the uh, potential to um, improve productivity if, uh, with an increase in access to psychotherapy for people with mild to moderate depression and anxiety. So rather than being insurance-based, it was grant-based. This was essentially rolled out by the National Health Service um, and uh, with a purpose-built workforce. So it wasn't enough to be a registered psychologist or social worker. You had to demonstrate that you had specific training um, for the specific types of therapies that were covered. Uh, under this program, and there were very clear targets with intensive performance monitoring in place from the get-go. So this would be as if the federal government or maybe the provincial government introduced a you know, CEI Act or something like that that was available free of charge with strictly enforced standards for training, evidence-based therapy, and um, uh, even session-by-session -session performance monitoring. So before we get too excited about the idea of Holus Bolus importing either of these models here, there's some key differences in the Canadian context that would need to be taken into account. So first, as I mentioned, we have this highly decentralized government structure um, with provincial and territorial jurisdiction over health and health insurance as opposed to in Australia where uh, the federal government runs Medicare. Um, and we also uh, have a smaller share of spending coming from the federal level of government than we do in Australia. A uh, deep but narrow approach to Medicare. Um, as I mentioned, we have first dollar coverage, uh, which basically means we're not allowed to do extra billing, but this is only for physician and hospital services. And really, we have um, a mix of grant and insurance-based funding models here. Um, we have you know, some community mental health center capacity. We have some collaborative care capacity where physicians uh, bring in other providers to form an interdisciplinary team. Um, and while wait times for these services are often long, there is considerable capacity to build on that we need to be mindful of. Uh, in addition, there's the uh, direct federal funding for uh, particular populations in Canada that needs to be considered um, and the fact that we have a much larger uh, degree of coverage um, through employment-based benefits. And while there are gaps and inconsistencies in that coverage, it's a much uh, bigger uh, part of the system here than in either uh, Australia or the UK. So uh, now that we have the situation in each country front of mind, we can turn our attention to mapping lessons learned in the UK and Australia onto the Canadian context. And the way this report and this presentation are organized is around these six uh, broad themes. And what they do is they point to the decisions that policymakers need to make in each of these domains. So to start, we'll look at how to map uh, lessons learned around planning onto the Canadian context. So first off, uh, there's a strong lesson that we should use uh, the strongest policy levers that we have. So you may have noticed that uh, in the UK, the model is aligned with the centralized control of the government in the United Kingdom, particularly as it applies to England, and that uh, better access takes full advantage of the fact that the federal government has jurisdiction over Medicare in Australia. So what's interesting is we, we think that we can't possibly do these things here because our system is so decentralized, but actually looked at from a different perspective, the provincial and territorial governments actually do have the levers to do either of these approaches. Um, 
you know, the, the obstacles are more related to policy legacies around not doing these things than anything um, that's technically not available. Uh, of course, funding is always an issue, but with the new uh, federal transfer, there's um, uh, some relief in that quarter. Uh, second of all, um, to increase supply, uh, it's important to, um, sorry, to increase access, it's, it's, one needs to also increase supply. So in England, a dedicated workforce was built from scratch, and in Australia, there was a kind of happy coincidence that the program was introduced at a time when the uh, relevant workforces were already growing, um, likely in anticipation of new opportunities. Um, so if we don't increase the supply, uh, uh, if we don't increase the number of people <laughs> who can provide services, the risk is that new programming could just shift providers around with the net result that we don't have any more Canadians actually receiving services. Um, so, uh, another important point is around uh, the need to engage not just providers but also users of services in planning. Um, certainly in the UK and Australia, uh, there was a lot of engagement with uh, providers of, of all sorts, um, which will be important here. Uh, but we also have an opportunity to be a leader in engaging service users here. Um, this was done to some extent in, in Australia and the UK, but I think we could do better here. Um, and we can also take advantage of um, the strength of work that's been uh, developing related to peer support. Um, and finally, planning up front. So, uh, you know, if we go with the model in the UK, we really have no need to reinvent a lot of the wheels that they use. There's all kinds of technical implementation materials that can be drawn on. And in Australia, we have the opportunity to uh, avoid some of the pitfalls that they encountered um, through a very quick implementation. Now we can benefit from their lessons learned and, and consider how to expand insurance um, without leading to some of the uh, uh, cost overruns that they experienced in Australia. And in addition, a lot of the groundwork has been done here around the business case, around assessing the degree of need and so forth. So we're not starting from scratch even in the Canadian context. So this is the first of several quotes that will be used in the presentation and it comes from interviews that I did um, as part of my dissertation research. Uh, this Australian researcher really highlights the importance of aligning service design with the strongest uh, policy levers available. Um, in Australia, as it would be for provincial and territorial governments here, expanding Medicare is relatively simple from an administrative perspective as opposed to launching in a whole new uh, program and managing it uh, centrally. So next we'll turn our attention to mapping funding lessons. Um, but first of all, Canadian policymakers uh, really need to carefully consider the advantages and trade-offs uh, of using a first dollar coverage approach versus co-payments. Um, in keeping with their systems, both the uh, UK and Australian approaches um, are, are aligned. So in the UK, IAP is free, and in Australia, better access uh, uh, allows providers to, re to um, require co-payments. Uh, here, if we have first dollar coverage, that would be consistent with uh, publicly funded services um, whether they're provided by doctors and covered through our insurance plans or in um, grant-funded community uh, health systems. But on the other hand, we have this large employment-based uh, sector where co-payments are uh, part and parcel of the service design. So we really need to carefully consider how um, each approach would impact on the alignment with both the public and private systems. Um, similarly, uh, when it comes to the grant versus insurance question, um, the advantage of, of starting now is that we can go in with a clear understanding of, of the trade-offs. Um, 
in, uh, in the UK, a grant-based approach gave a lot of control over costs and the ability to have a lot of treatment fidelity, but there's a lot of hands-on uh, support that's required um, with the Australian model of expanding Medicare coverage. Um, this was more straightforward, but they ran into some issues with uh, cost overruns and their degree of quality assurance, while, while high, is not as rigorous as it is uh, in the UK. Um, and in terms of cost shifting, to, to pick up again on this point about the employment-based uh, coverage that we have here, um, in Australia when they introduced uh, better access, as a, when they expanded Medicare coverage, um, private claims through uh, employment-based coverage did go down. In fact, they dropped by half. On the other hand, they were really this, this difference was really dwarfed by the surge in demand for the publicly funded program. So Canadians are similarly likely to uh, vote with their feet to whichever program is, is, uh, provides the best value for money. And um, uh, this points to the importance of both keeping a close eye on this, but also of collaboration between the um, uh, between government-funded programs and also um, employment-based insurers, insurance. So uh, now we turn to service provision lessons. Um, first, at a minimum, it seems to make sense to start with at least uh, as broad a range of providers as has been used in the UK and Australia. Um, so while IAPT uh, requires IAP specific credentials. They also have drawn on um, a range of levels of qualification. So they hire both low intensity therapists with uh, uh, a lighter amount of uh, training, but also high intensity therapists who meet more professional criteria. Um, and in Australia, right from the get-go, psychologists, social workers, and OTs have, have been uh, included in the expanded coverage. Um, we uh, could similarly start with and build on our strengths that we have um, regulated allied mental health professions, psychologists, social workers, occupational therapists, and uh, in some provinces, uh, some form of psychotherapy or clinical counseling uh, are increasingly being uh, regulated. And we also have a strong uh, foundation of certifications in peer support, substance use counseling, and psychosocial rehabilitation. Um, <laughs> similarly, uh, when it comes to GP and self-referral, um, some mix seems warranted in Canada. In Australia, uh, better access requires a GP referral, and in the UK, um, both self-referral and GP referral are allowed. Um, you know, here uh, it would make sense to have a mix in part because that gives more flexibility to people who are seeking services, but also because we have a bigger issue with physician shortages here in um, Canada, not just in rural or remote communities, but as someone who's been trying to get a doctor for the last six months, <laughs> I can say even in, in larger urban centers like Ottawa. So. Um, this issue around stepped and seamless care it could be a considerable challenge here. It has been in the UK and Australia as well. Um, the two models have had different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, in the UK, there's because they have this really distinct standalone program, improving access to psychological therapies, there's great step care within the program, but not so much with other parts of the continuum of the mental health system. And in Australia, because of this connection with GP referral, there's good connections with primary care, but they really haven't uh, built a stepped care model in any systematic way beyond that. Um, here, with our fragmented federal provincial territorial system, with the fact that we have these federally funded services for particular populations, and also because of the employment-based sector being so strong here, uh, stepped care is going to be something that requires some significant uh, attention. 
So this next quote uh, introduces another service provision lesson, um, the need and importance of implementation support. Uh, you know, this was particularly strong in the United Kingdom, as can be seen here in this quote from a policymaker there. Um, you know, if an Australian model is adopted, there's less of a need for this. Um, in part because expanding Medicare coverage kind of implements itself, um, but at the same time uh, being mindful of what additional implementation supports could help strengthen the program would be important. Uh, so in Canada, the kind of implementation resources that we could draw on it'd be our Pan-Canadian Health Organizations, uh, Accreditation Canada, the Provincial Health Quality Councils, and, and so on, that we need to draw in whatever resources we can. With regard to the range of therapies, um, starting with at least the same range as in uh, the UK seems warranted. Um, well, IAPT is often associated with cognitive behavioral therapy, and in fact, it actually covers a range of, um, of, uh, of therapies that are approved by, by NICE. Um, and it would make sense to start at least with the similar range here rather than limiting ourselves to uh, just one particular uh, modality. Um, but the principle of uh, following the evidence base very closely, it makes sense. On the other hand, the approach taken in Australia of relying on um, professional associations to regulate quality assurance has led to significant gains um, in access uh, and could be adopted here as well. Uh, in terms of caps, um, some kind of flexible cap seems warranted. This was a real issue in Australia when they experienced a real surge in demand, they uh, reduced their caps as part of their cost containment. Um, in the United Kingdom, they've been able to be more flexible, but in the context of very tight oversight over, um, over outcomes. And uh, you know, the importance here of aligning with um, caps in existing caps in employment-based coverage is something else that needs to be uh, considered in the Canadian context. So this next quote uh, turns us to uh, consideration of lessons around equity. Um, you know, this quote from uh, an Australian researcher points to how universal coverage, uh, while it addresses um, inequities in access in, in in principle, it, it's not really a guarantee of equitable uptake and equitable outcomes arising from uh, reform. <clears throat> so of all of the material in this presentation, the importance of setting equity targets uh, it is, in my view, the most important. Uh, it's really at the heart of um, what is required to do away with the two-tier system uh, which has been the main um, concern that we have in Canada about access to psychotherapy. Um, and yes, either an IAPT model or an, uh, a better access model um, would go great distances towards this by providing universal coverage. It would be no more of a guarantee of uh, equitable uptake here than it has been in uh, Australia and, and the United Kingdom. So the importance of closely monitoring uh, the um, uh, equity of uptake, the equity of utilization, the equity of outcomes uh, across uh, different dimensions of equity, whether it's income or ethnicity, racialized racialization, uh, sexual orientation, and so on, um, urban and rural, all these things are equally important here, and also uh, indigenous issues um, and identities, that, that um, we need to closely track the impact of reforms, and we need to supplement um, universal appro approaches with targeted approaches um, uh, to the extent that it's warranted until we get it right. 
Okay, so um, with regards to scope, uh, I think the main message is that, you know, we can't do it all at once. Um, you know, if we try to do everything, we're more likely to weaken uh, the political will that does exist for um, these kinds of reforms. And uh, uh, in both Australia and the UK, there was a strong identification uh, of the reform with uh, scope around mild to moderate mental disorders, anxiety and depression, at least at the outset. Um, further into their implementation, both countries have uh, started to broaden uh, uh, their scope, but they have that strong foundation of um, evidence and political will to um, build from. Um, at the same time, uh, I think a Made in Canada approach uh, requires including explicitly substance use in the scope, that having a program that targets mild to moderate depression and anxiety without similarly including expanding access to psychotherapy uh, as warranted for substance use issues uh, would, would be out of step with our policy environment. Okay, so now we're going to turn to consideration of performance monitoring. Um, we know that we uh, need a strong performance monitoring approach to reform, but how much is too much? Uh, Australia has been very hands-off, uh, uh, has done one evaluation that was able to demonstrate strong impacts, but um, very different than what's been done in the UK where they can uh, talk on a much more rigorous uh, basis about annual impacts, monthly impacts across all different points of the um, uh, treatment cycle. Uh, on the other hand, as you can see from this quote from a UK researcher, that there's a risk of um, having too much uh, monitoring that it starts to become kind of oppressive uh, for providers in the system and how important it is if, if you go in that direction to couple that with uh, strong clinical leadership uh, to keep the focus on um, using the performance monitoring to improve outcomes for clients uh, as opposed to um, as a, a vehicle for um, uh, dictating and the kind of micromanaging, I guess is a good way of putting it, the uh, providers. So uh, looking at the first uh, area related to monitoring and sustainability, um, you know, IAPT has, as I mentioned, demonstrated success against really clear targets, um, but has had to balance that against this risk of micromanagement um, and uh, better access has been able to demonstrate results but doesn't really have the depth uh, behind it in terms of the quality assurance. So um, federal, provincial, territorial governments uh, since the report was written, they've actually released the high-level indicators that are mentioned here, um, but they're nowhere close to the level of detail that would help us really track an impact in, in expanding access to psychotherapy. Um, you know, this would require uh, political will and clinical leadership um, at, at federal level, provincial, territorial level, regional health authority levels, uh, or specific program areas could really uh, demonstrate leadership uh, here, and with that, we could we could um, we could implement uh, IAP style uh, targets and and even exceed them. But it's it's a matter of of really making that a priority. Clinical supervision it's a given an important mechanism for quality assurance. Uh, in, in Australia and in the United Kingdom and, and certainly would, would be here as well and needs to be built into the service system design. And as is the importance of cultivating champions when it comes to uh, sustaining support uh, for the program. Um, 
you know, that was critical in, in both the United Kingdom and in Australia, and is even more so here, where we have this uh, challenging federal, provincial, uh, territorial context, um, the importance of political champions. So before concluding, I'll just review the key messages from the report and then look forward to hearing your uh, questions and working to answer them as best I can. Uh, first of all is that access and equity can be improved, that the significant increases in access to psychotherapy, that they can be replicated here in Canada. Uh, we would need to adapt our approach and draw on the lessons learned in, in the United Kingdom and in Australia. But really, if it can be done in those two countries, there's no reason why we can't do it here as well. Um, that there are many trade-offs that need to be assessed um, when thinking about a grant-based approach versus an insurance-based approach. Um, there's pros and cons with each, uh, but both are possible here. Um, and uh, you know, with the um, policy levers at the provincial territorial level and with the recent targeted fiscal support from the federal government, there's, there is this real window of opportunity. In terms of adapting to the Canadian context, the key features that need to be considered first are deep but narrow um, Medicare model. Um, and the strength of our employment-based insurance sector. Um, uh, second, the strengths that we have to draw on uh, in the community mental health sector, in collaborative care, in employment-based insurance, and in our implementation uh, capacity. Um, we uh, aren't starting from, from scratch. Uh, in terms of our federally funded services um, for First Nations and Inuit, for veterans, military refugees, uh, and within the federal correctional system. It's important that these be considered uh, so that they can be seamlessly integrated uh, with whatever expanded public funding is introduced. Um, that uh, we're going to need a strong approach to performance management here because of our decentralized context and because of our current two-tier system that uh, require clear equity targets to be uh, set from the beginning. And that, you know, in terms of uh, workforce engagement uh, and increasing supply, you know, that was critical in both the UK and Australia and, and maybe even more so here because our mental health workforce planning is, is relatively weak. Um, I'm pretty sure Kai High is coming out with some new reports on the psychology and social work uh, workforce this mm -hmm. fall, so that maybe um, address some of the gaps that currently exist, but we'll see. And then in terms of design and leadership, um, as I mentioned, uh, including a range of qualified providers and evidence-based psychotherapies consistent with what's been done in Australia and the UK, allowing flexibility with the referral mechanism and the number of uh, uh, sessions permitted, um, starting with mild to moderate scope and then broadening out uh, seems to be warranted based on the experiences in uh, the UK and Australia. And then, uh, last of all, that we have the opportunity for uh, international leadership in um, including uh, substance abuse, sorry, substance use in uh, uh, within the scope of expanded access to sex therapy, and engaging people with lived experience in the design and delivery of psychotherapy reform uh, from the get-go. So. Um, this window of opportunity is open now, um, but the key variable will be how much expanding access to psychotherapy as a discrete objective is uh, a priority at the um, decision-making level. And um, you know, this paper could act as a guide for discussion and dialogue about what's possible in, um, you know, at the federal level with provincial and territorial governments um, or within regions and communities and different sectors 
to really get into some of the service design and implementation issues. And uh, for those of you who joined the call, considering what what um, your role is, what kinds of um, uh, influence that you have, what could you do to contribute to um, keeping this issue on the front burner with and keeping this keeping it in the window of opportunity before it closes. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary. That was um, very, very well presented, clear. Um, and we are now going to move into discussion. So please submit your questions or comments in the Q&A box just at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have one question. Mary, can you speak more to the role of profession, that professional associations can play here in Canada drawing on the Australian model? Sure, thanks, Kim. Uh, well, in Australia, certainly the because the approach was to expand Medicare coverage and to have the, um, the quality assurance was really relying on what the existing infrastructure that was in place that regulates uh, the professionals that were covered. Uh, something similar could be done here. Um, I think because in Canada we have an emerging regulated psychotherapy, clinical counseling uh, uh, capacity, it would be important to, to bring that in as well in addition to the psychology and social work and OTs and, you know, there's some other professions uh, in nursing and so on that, that need to be considered. Um, you know, even with uh, a UK style model, while the UK built uh, a workforce, purpose-built a workforce, uh, it drew on the uh, professional capacity um, and, you know, so to the extent that that approach is taken here, um, the uh, professional associations can also play a, a role in um, promoting the quality of uh, their membership and uh, considering some of the, you know, being part of the discussion around how to ensure the evidence base of uh, the evidence base, the, the capacity of the existing workforce to provide evidence-based therapies. Thank you, Mary. Do we have any other questions um, or comments on today's presentation? Okay, we have one from Gregory. Um, I'm curious about the window of opportunity as you see it. With seven of 13 bilateral agreements already concluded between the federal and provincial territorial governments regarding the 10 billion in mental health services um, in, under the common statement of principles, is there really an opportunity to make this a common priority at this time? Well, frankly, with both Ontario and Quebec having made significant commitments in this area. Uh, I don't know that we need all provinces and territories to be um, prior, prioritizing expanding access to psychotherapy to uh, have a significant momentum build for this reform in the Canadian context. Um, certainly other provinces uh, as I mentioned, Newfoundland is doing some work in this area. I, I haven't reviewed all of the uh, agreements, um, but uh, I would imagine that there's some uh, ways in which each of them are addressing this to some extent. So um, the opportunity for knowledge exchange and for momentum, I think, uh, isn't just limited to um, uh, the two provinces that have made the most explicit moves in this area. Um, but how, how much of the population is Ontario and Quebec? It's quite quite a lot. So uh, that we have two such big provinces moving in this area, I think, has the potential to influence smaller jurisdictions down the road as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Gregory, for the question. Um, I don't see, uh, oh, just one moment, I'm gonna go down. Okay, we have a question from Dr. Alain Lesage. If we further explore Medicare, the Medicare model of insurability of psychotherapy, 
Shall the next step be asking both private and provincial health insurance actuarians to modelize the costs and benefits of the model of universal drug coverage, private, public, in the place of Quebec, for example? So I believe that um, this question is referencing um, the Pharmacare program in Quebec as having balanced out um, existing private extended health benefits with um, public coverage for um, Pharmacare, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, Alain, I think that, that uh, you know, whatever can be done to further develop um, implementation uh, advice at this point is, is all to the good. And I do think that the importance of engaging on this issue of what it means to expand public funding in a system where uh, we have a significant uh, private sector capacity, and by that I mean the employment-based benefits side of things is going to be important. Um, you know, I think the fact that that some of these discussions are ongoing related to pharmacare broadly writ. There's a lot of synergies with the policy questions that need to be considered related to this issue as well. Um, you know, if I had my wish, all of these gaps in Medicare would be getting addressed together rather than separately. Um, but mm -hmm. since that doesn't seem to be going to happen, uh, what, whatever we can do to, um, you know, take advantage of uh, synergies between whether it's pharmacare or dental care or psychotherapy, um, a lot of the same policy questions need to be, be raised. Mm -hmm. And just to um, add, add to what Mary just um, responded, I think to your point earlier when you emphasize the importance of you know, the need to not start from scratch to share knowledge and information on what currently is being done across jurisdictions, that there are these, aside from the structured psychotherapy program being, programs being introduced, there are these practices and programs that could be um, used as templates or um, as pathways. So uh, we have another question from Gregory. What is your sense of whether the Ford government will continue with the budget announcements in this area um, announced by the previous government in Ontario? I don't know, to be honest. Uh, uh, I think they've been clear uh, that they intend to continue with a significant investment in mental health, uh, that that was something that was clear from the, uh, I don't know if it was in the campaign promises or things that were announced afterwards, um, but the specificity of what they're planning to spend on is, is has yet to be, um, announced. Uh, I do think that expanding access to psychotherapy is something that can appeal to governments across the political spectrum. Um, so I'm cautiously optimistic that uh, the structured psychotherapy program will continue to uh, develop and expand beyond the what's essentially been a, a pilot phase that was launched by the Liberals. But I, I, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. um, a question from Krista Shackelford. Hi, Mary. Can you speak more to certification as it relates to peer support in Canada? Are there attempts to professionalize, certify beyond PSACC, Peer Support Accreditation Certification Canada? To my knowledge, PSACC certification is prohibitively expensive for some consumer survivor organizations. Yeah, hi, thanks, Krista. I'm sorry I don't have the answer to that question, but uh, I think it's an important one, and I know that um, you know yeah, here with my mental health commission colleagues and and uh, with um, uh, colleagues elsewhere, that's something that we can try and take a closer look at uh, to make sure that it's um, you know, that those financial barriers are not prohibitive. But uh, I can take that forward to the best of my ability, but I, I don't uh, know what lower cost, like what's being done to address the issue that you raise. I, I'm not sure. Um, 
In reference to the previous question around um, modelization, um, Elaine Lesage has asked only the federal can commission this type of modelization. Would this be an important lever, in your opinion, to modelize the public? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess Elaine, I'm not, I'm not sure why only the federal government would be able to commission that type of research because a lot of it, I think, would have to be done looking at the specifics of each provincial system. I mean, there's different ways that this could be done. This could be done at the provincial level or territorial level. It could also be done through some sort of national national study. So uh, I do think both are possible. Um, and it comes down to, either way, it comes down to making this kind of policy development and the research to support it a, a priority. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for all the questions so far. Um, we are nearing the end of our time, but does anyone else um, have anything to share or a question that they, a burning question that they'd like answered while we have Mary um, on the line with us today? Um, while we are waiting for people to flood us with additional questions, I just wanted to, um, to ask Mary a follow-up question. So um, Gregory had asked about the, um, to get your sense about whether the new government in Ontario would continue with the structured psychotherapy funding. And I'm just curious to know, um, you know, why was the UK, why was the UK able to establish buy-in um, across the political spectrum so effectively? Um, you know, what is your sense of, of what the special ingredients were there in terms of having the program be continually funded through um, different elections and different parties coming into power? And well, I mean, frankly, in both countries, the programs have been sustained. So I don't think that, I mean, the, the thing that comes to mind as you asked the question was, well, in the UK, they were able to point to these very uh, compelling results and evidence around recovery outcomes, uh, around the expanded reach, and so on and so forth. But, and that that's kind of kept them going through various changes in government and, and whatnot. But the reality is that in Australia, they've also been able to sustain uh, the program. And while they were, they did put some caps on the number of sessions that were allowed, that it's continued to be universally available and demand driven. Like there's no sort of cap on the total budget for the program per se. Um, so uh, I think that this issue, like once you get this started, because there's such demand for it, I think it's very difficult for governments to uh, pull it back. And, um, you know, yes, it helps to have really rigorous reporting, but I don't know that it's really necessary to have that to sustain the uh, political commitment across um, changes in government. I think it becomes something that's difficult to uh, pull back from because it's uh, the utilization is, um, you know, it's popular. People want to have this service and once it gets started, it would be politically difficult to, to pull it back. And that's part of why I'm cautiously optimistic that in Ontario it would be difficult to pull back from what's already begun in terms of the structured psychotherapy program. Uh, yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have a comment just saying, interesting presentation, lots of information to adjust and ponder. Thank you. Um, I concur. It was fantastic to have everybody here with us today. We do have one more comment from um, Alain Lesage asking about um, the federal government looking at PharmaCare as an option and, you know, why should it be different for psychotherapy in terms of introducing? I think that that's uh, going to be something important for uh, people in the mental health community to continue to raise as the PharmaCare uh, uh, initiative unfolds, the, the connections between what's being discussed and the level of federal attention to continue to hold the, the feet of governments to the fire uh, around uh, access to psychotherapy that just because we've got this 10, uh, sorry, this $5 billion over 10 years doesn't mean we're going to get the outcomes that we need unless 
people continue to advocate uh, around specific issues and around uh, accountability uh, measures being in place and the kind of research and federal leadership that's needed to um, uh, make the most of that uh, $5 billion. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you for all of the questions. Um, the PowerPoint that you just saw is available for download right now in the resources box directly above the question and answer box, as well as the full report. I want to um, just thank Mary so much for your time today and for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. And um, thank everyone who joined us for this conversation and discussion. Please do not hesitate to be in touch should you have any questions about this work moving forward um, or would like to get in touch with Mary, you can um, contact me. The email is up on the slide. Um, I, yep, thank you so much everybody. Have a wonderful day.